Welcome to the Board of Education's board meeting. May I have a motion to go into closed session? Pursuant to the general provisions, Article 3-305 and 3-104, I move we go into closed session to discuss matters that relate to negotiations, to discuss appointments, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom this public body has jurisdiction, and to consult with counsel. A second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. no. The ayes have it. We will see you back here at 6 p.m. Welcome to the 6 p.m. open session of the Board of Education meeting. Ms. We would like to have everyone stand for the pledge, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome to the September 5th Board of Education meeting. This is a public meeting that is being videotaped for county citizens to review on QAC TV Channel 7, a local cable station. The agenda is available at the door at the information table. During this meeting, we ask that you turn off your cell phones and hold all personal conversations and comments outside the meeting room. We, um, I'm sorry, I was supposed to say that before we pledged. <laughs> I'll take a pass and we pledged early. Um, and I'll turn this over to Annette now. Oh yeah, thanks. <laughs> now that I'm in my one little laughing fit over here. Okay, um, we have to, uh, do we have to, yeah, we have to change the agenda because they, oh no, it's yeah. right on this one. I, um, I make a motion that we approve the minutes from August 8th and 29th. I second the motion. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. The ayes have it. May I have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. Uh, before we go into the recognitions, today uh, the board received a letter um, from the uh, Orlean Bishop Taylor family. And um, I'd like to read that and um, tell you exactly what's going on here. So. Dear Queen Anne's County Board members, on behalf of the Taylor family, I'd like to express how grateful and honored the entire family would be to have a portion of the new library at Graysonville Elementary School named in honor of our beloved daughter, sister, aunt, and cousin. As you know, Arlene worked tirelessly to support her community and even those outside of this community. We thank you for your effort in achieving this great honor and pray God's blessings upon all of you. Uh, sincerely, Lenwood Taylor, uh, the, fam uh, the father of uh, Bishop Taylor. So we just wanted to put it out there that um, we are checking into this. Mr. Pender is checking in to um, possibly doing something at Graysonville Elementary School where uh, Arlene really actually did do a lot of reading to the children in the library and participated a lot at that school. So we just wanted to make sure everyone was aware of that. And Dr. Kane and, and uh, Mr. Pender will take it from here to find out what we need to do. Okay, and at this time we're gonna turn it over to you, Dr. Kane. Okay, very good. We do have a recognition for this evening. Um, today we'd like to recognize a seventh grader from Centerville Middle School, um, Julie, Julia Kreis. I apologize if I'm I saying that correctly. Is it Kreis or Kreis? Crees, all right, Julia Crees. Let me just tell you a little bit about Julia. Um, and this comes from Julia's uh, history teacher, Mr. Andy Anders. Last school year, seventh grader Julia Crees um, entered a, nation, a nationwide contest from the German embassy. The purpose of the contest was to encourage American students to get to know modern Germany. She had to choose between writing about German inventions or the Berlin Airlift. This year was the 70th anniversary. She wrote her essay on the Berlin Airlift. She has a grandfather who helped with the Berlin Airlift. She placed first for grades six through eight. We'd like to congratulate you, Julia, for that. 
Last year, Julia also placed first for her Americanism essay for grades seven and eight. She also made it to the states with her essay for National History Day. She is a hardworking student with a true gift for writing. Mr. Anders has no doubt that these are this is just the start of the recognitions for your writing, and we congratulate you once again, Julia. Thank you very much for your work. We're going to come and take a picture up front. Um, I'm going to ask Mr. P or somebody to grab a, we don't have our communications person just yet, so if you grab a cell and take a picture, we'll post it to the website. Jeff has one. Jeff has his camera. You got your camera? Okay, good. Um, at this time, we'll have the signing of the negotiated contracts for Unit 1, Unit 2, Support Units 1, 2, and 3. Go ahead first. Mr. Okay. Fister ahead, and Mr. Farley, do you want us to come down? Okay. Yes, please. Give me a pen. That's blue. Yeah. I'm not sure what. I think it, it has to be black. Oh, you have a blue. Yeah. Maybe it has to be blue. Which might be important. Yeah. <coughs> you do it from here. Okay. Is this one line? Okay. Um, Dr. Kane and Mr. Maggio, um, for the unit one scales, the salary scales that are in the agreement tonight. Um, there was a small um, error on the step 20 numbers that were there, but I've worked with Mr. Pippo and we're going to make those adjustments. Um, so everything is fine. It doesn't change the dollar amount or the, or the obligation, but we just worked with each other to notice the small um, misstatement of values on step 20, but they, are, they will be corrected. And that's good with Mr. Pippo and Mr. Fields. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Thank, Thank you. you. So with that, we'll start out with uh, certificated unit one. Um, and we have two copies here. I have a pen. You can just use my pen. Let's just sign this one. Do you want both signed, Karen? Or do you, can I just make scan it into you? That's fine. Okay, thanks. So um, this would be you, Mr. Maggio. It's black. I'm sorry. <laughs> Did you? I didn't have purple. I'm sorry. Where am I signing? Right yes. here. Dr. Kane. Wearing You know, the board historian. Okay. 
Anybody else? So we're going to scan this into you and, and return it tomorrow, if that's okay. And certificated unit two. Oh, oh do you want to do this? Well, no, we're, we're, we have we're one, two, and three. Do you want to, so they want to do the support units first. Please bear with us. I'm sorry. We're already here. Okay, no, no intentional select. So this is uh, a second one. copy. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, certificated or support unit one. And here's the signature. Let's see, that's the addendum. And that's the signature page. I'd also like to thank the board for all your hard work that you've done this year. Um, I know we had an initial um, ratified contract that just wasn't funded by the powers to be, but we appreciate all your hard work and going back to the table for us, and um, thank you, and I'm sure students appreciate you as well. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Go ahead, Bill. Right there. Right there. Yeah, yeah, so. <laughs> um, I would also like to thank the board on behalf of the ESP. Um, I know it was a long fight, but ESP, much appreciate. So thank you. Thank you, Vera. Go ahead, Marcus. <coughs> So we're on support unit two. Again, we'll scan these back to you, Art. Okay. <coughs> Here's the support unit two agreement. Support Unit I'm fine. I'll sit here. <laughs> Thank you, board members, for the support side of it. I truly appreciate that.
And now we can do uh, we can do uh, certificated unit two. Okay, Mr. Schreckengoss, Mr. Page. Yeah, I got it right here. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thought I lost it. Nope, got it. So, President DiMaggio, uh, members of the board, I would also, on behalf of ANS, like to thank you for all the time and the effort that went into a contract of which we are very, very proud. Thank you very, very much. Wonderful thing. <laughs> With great pleasure, it yes. comes to an end. <laughs> <laughs> For now, anyhow. Congratulations, all of you. <laughs> I know, yeah. isn't that the truth? <laughs> isn't that the truth, Karen? Thank you very much. Um, at this time, we're going to move on to community invo involvement. Dr. Uh, Kane, uh, would you like to share your events? Absolutely. So I'm going to go through some that we have done already, and then I'm going to go on to some that are coming forward. So on August 10th, I... Um, attended the Julianne Rosella Foundation Golf Tournament, and that was held at the Queenstown Harbor Golf Course. I'm not sure if everybody is familiar, so just a little bit of background. This foundation is a, it's a local component of Chesapeake Charities on Kent Island. Um, it was established to uh, you know, offer a tribute to Julianne <coughs> Rosella, a seven-year-old girl whose life was lost um, at the boat races on Kent Island in 2015. So the foundation raises funds uh, for two purposes. It raises funds to support families who have experienced some type of tragic loss, but it also supports um, scholarships in our schools. So it has supported two scholarships, $5,000 each, one for a boy, one for a girl at Kent Island, and now the foundation and the family is moving, extending that uh, scholarship to Queen Anne's County High School. So one boy and one girl at Queen Anne's County will also receive scholarships. So that's a total of $20,000 that this foundation is raising for our students. So I certainly want to recognize and thank them for that. Um, August 14, 15, and 16, we had our Leadership Institute, so all of ANS and our school leadership teams, we got together, and, and I don't want to say anything that uh, Mr. P or anybody else is going to say, but just in summary, we had three great days. Uh, we had everything from uh, priorities, establishing priorities for the 18-19 uh, school year to um, equity and diversity training, which is a priority for us, so everyone was engaged in that, and then we had updates from all of our departments as well as a full day of emergency preparedness training um, and I just like to thank Mr. Pender for organizing that with his team in collaboration with uh, the Sheriff's Department, uh, Centerville Police, Fire Department, EMS, every every emergency service that is available to residents of Queen Anne's County was there to support us and ensure that we had training um, what to do in the event of heaven forbid an active assailant uh, being in our schools so all of our employees groups are being trained and, and I'll let Mr. Pender talk about that but all of our groups are being trained I believe we have one group uh, left to train but we'll have ongoing professional development all throughout the year uh, just to prepare us and, and just you know heaven forbid something happen there's no book 
that we can write to say, first do this, then do this, then, then do this, but to be prepared with some strategies, some ideas of what we might be able to do, and not forgetting that all important component about mental um, health. So we've uh, had that training, we did the Stop the Bleed training, and that was phenomenal. So, and, and just, we have heard rave reviews from our teachers, our administrators, nurses, uh, counselors, everybody has had it, so it's been wonderful. And I'll let Mr. Pender talk more on that in a bit. But on August the 20th, we welcomed our new teachers. So we welcomed 40 new teachers, and that was wonderful. Um, I'd like to thank our board members who were there for lunch. So we had Captain Kelly there, and we also had Ms. O'Connor there. Did I miss anybody? Okay, so, and that was a great time with our new teachers. Of course, on the 28th, uh, Mr. Pender, myself, Ms. Pullen, um, Mr. Dunn, we had a chance to meet with um, the Interagency Commission on School Construction. So we talked about our school construction projects to include uh, the possibility of the replacement of Centerville Middle School. So had a lot of conversation, understanding what the new um, lead for the IEC is expecting. He's moving to, uh, from a fund-based uh, program or model to a needs-based model. So that's going to be important for us as we continue to, to work on our projects and plan for our projects throughout the year. On September 4th and 5th, of course, we welcomed our students, and it has been a wonderful, wonderful week. We've been to all of the schools, Mr. P and myself, of course, Mr. Pender's been out, all of the exec, exec team has been out. We did our uh, infamous bus ride on yesterday, and this year, Mr. P and I, we did the Centerville uh, school area, so that has been um, wonderful, and I just can't say enough about our bus drivers. Our bus drivers, the relationships that they build with our students and our families. They know the students by name and the new students, they are quickly pick it up. Uh, they set expectations for behavior on our buses and they just are there for our students, part of the family. So I'm just grateful for the work that our bus drivers are doing. Um, I got a couple more, I'll make this pretty quick because I know other people have things that they wanna say, but on tomorrow we'll welcome our pre-K and our kindergarten students. I'm looking forward to that. I'd like to remind everybody that next week is Suicide Prevention Week. So please have that on your radar. We wanna make sure that we're taking care of each other and we're doing some work with our students in the classroom so that they are taking care of each other as well. Um, that's gonna happen at both schools. We have, we'll start our, um, um, equal Opportunity Schools Work, which is a program that we're doing at both of our high schools to ensure that we have our minority students and our students who are not typically represented in advanced level classes. They'll be working with our staff at the schools to ensure that we are um, doing all that we can to ensure that those students are part of advanced level classes. So Ms. Teddy and Ms. Miles, spread the word. Um, that's going to be some exciting work that we'll do. On September 12th, there will be a dinner and a lecture at Chesapeake uh, College by Dr. Eric Dyson. We partnered with um, uh, Margaret Tessier, who uh, she, she's been planning that um, event. Dr. Dyson, Eric Dyson, he's a very well-known uh, preacher, radio host. He's a professor at Georgetown University, but he's an author. He's an author of more than 20 books, mostly centered on racism in America and some notable African Americans. But it's going to be a very, very interesting talk that he's going to give. And I hope that all who are interested in equity and diversity make it out to Chesapeake College on September 12th. On the 25th, we'll have the League of Women Voters in our high schools. They'll set up tables for voter registration. And on September 27th, right here at the Board of Education, we will have the Kent Island Beach Cleanup and Sculpture Unveiling Ceremony. Special shout out to Mr. Page for supporting that project. It'll be here on the 27th at 6 o'clock. So those are just a couple things coming up and, and some exciting things that have happened. So, Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Pendlewski. Thank you, Mr. DiMaggio. The only thing I wanted to add is we're off to a great school year. My comments will be included in our opening schools report. Thank you. At this time, we'd welcome, like to welcome our new um, school student school board members. Um, we have Ms. Miles and Ms. Tenney over here. And we're going to see, um, we're going to let Marissa, is that correct? Okay. Yes. Um, if you'd like to tell us what's going on with your schools, we'll start with you. Yes. So at Ken Island High School, I represent Ken Island High School, 
and today we had a successful first day of school and distributed laptops to each student. Um, tomorrow we will have a, an assembly on school safety and Friday we will have picture day. And then our biggest event is this month, homecoming. So Friday the 21st we will have a pep rally parade and football game and then Saturday the 22nd we will have our dance from 5 to 8 p.m. Okay. Ms. Miles, how about you? Um, hello, I'm Ariel. I represent Queen Anne's County High School. Um, first and foremost, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, a few things that I did this summer. Um, so first, I was sent to um, MLW, which is a leadership workshop. Um, I attended ALS, which is Advanced Leadership Seminar. Thank you for sending me, by the way. Um, and it's a magical place. Like, if you can send your kids, please do. Um, they teach you about planning and taking your next steps, whether it be college or work. Um, you build amazing friendships. Um, one workshop that I really remember was about failure. And something that I'll take from that, it's, they told me, it's OK to fail, but make sure you don't set yourself up for it. So that's something that I will remember from that workshop. Um, also, MABE. Maryland Association um, of Boards of Education. Um, they hosted all of the student members of the board um, from all the counties, and it was really interesting um, to chat with some of them because it is a really big thing on the Western Shore, and of course it's like a big deal here, but they do a ton of stuff, whether it be visiting schools, hosting big events, um, things like that. So what I took from that, um, I wrote a list of goals that I have for this year, um, yesterday actually, I met with Ms. Hudak and we talked a lot about things that I want to accomplish this year. Um, details are coming. I have a few programs that I want to start, so I'll let you know how that goes when you know it all gets put together. So that's all I have. Thank you. Great. Thank you, and welcome, welcome. At this time, we will move on to community participation. Mrs. Harlow. Thank you. We um, ask our speakers to keep in mind the following guidelines. Speakers should sign the roster, including their telephone, telephone number and their address. Also speak that when you come to the podium, your um, name and the town you reside in. Comments should be limited to three minutes in length. Comments longer than three minutes should be submitted in writing. Organizations, municipalities, and elected officials can be allowed five minutes. Individuals are allowed three minutes. Questions or statements to the board that relate to a recent agenda item, an agenda item that is expected to appear in the future, or a matter of general policy over which the board has authority. Those are the guidelines. Please do not discuss items related to negotiations. Those items are to be discussed at the bargaining table. This is not the proper venue to address specific student or employee personnel matters, especially those matters on legal appeal to the board. Comments about the actions or statements of individual staff members are not appropriate for public comment and should be referred to the superintendent of schools or processed through the available channels. Citizens' participation is not intended to be a question and answer session. If you have specific questions, the board will make sure an appropriate staff member responds to your question in a timely manner at a later date. The board respects your desire and your right to convey your message freely, but asks as a courtesy to this board and, other, and our citizens that you respect the board's request to refrain from naming citizens and name calling when offering your critique. And the first person we have signed up to speak is Daria Van Lu. And there's also Ellen Yana. Yang. 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 Oh, I'm sorry. So where do I? Okay. Okay. Yep. Great. Thank you. Good evening. My name's Dara Van Lu, and I am a parent of the uh, Kent Island High School sailing team. And this evening, I have uh, Miss Ellen Yang with me as well. She is also a parent of one of the sailors. And we also have a handful of sailors with us this evening. Uh, Corbin Voorhees, which is her son, my son, Riley Van Lu, and we have Doug McDonald and Mary McDonald. And we also are fortunate to have our coach here, Coach Amanda Shepard. Um, they had practice, so we came straight from practice here to the board meeting this evening. So um, we are here tonight uh, seeking the Board of Education support and recognizing our team, sport, and furthering the growth and development of our team and sport by providing monetary aid. Uh, our team is currently in its fifth year. 
Uh, the team is made up of approximately 30 individuals of various backgrounds and grades. We started out with about a dozen team members when we first started, so our team has grown. Uh, it's a very diverse team. We have outstanding participation. This year our registration was filled up in record time where we actually had to turn away sailors because we can only have a certain number of sailors based on our resources available. Uh, the team practices at the Kent Island Yacht, Yacht Club. We have 12 420 boats. Uh, we practice and participate both in the fall and spring. Uh, the team hosts two regattas each year as well, in the fall and the spring. Much of the support that we do in order to uh, carry out our program is done through volunteers and donations from families, relatives, and organizations. Um, in fact, the 12 boats that we have were actually donated by one of the families of the team. Um, the maintenance of our boats and docks is accomplished by volunteers. Transportation to and from practices and regattas is through volunteers. And up until two years ago, all of the coaching was in the form of volunteers. Uh, parents continue to volunteer to assist with coaching. Currently, we have one paid coach, but desperately need a second. Each sailor is required to have a payment of $225 each season for participation. Um, we also do conduct some fundraising activities. We've uh, done some con concession stand manning at the high school as well as at our regattas. Um, so that helps us a little bit. So why is it important to support the high school sailing team? There's many reasons to do so, with the biggest one being what it does for the individual. Sailing provides valuable life lessons to include confidence, independence, respect for the environment, critical and strategic thinking, physical activity, teamwork, character building, and also a lifelong skill. In addition, it's an outstanding extracurricular activity for those seeking further education beyond high school. It's one of the fastest growing sports uh, in the Annapolis, and Annapolis is really considered the sailing capital of the world. Our area has also become one of the most well-known and largest sailing racing scenes in the country, attracting college recruiters. For example, Stanford University sailing team signs one to two female sailors from the Annapolis region yearly. The regattas we attend have approximately 20 different schools, both private and public schools. We're proud to say that our team affords the opportunity for all students to, of various backgrounds to participate. We've been quite successful. We're 21, te 21 Maryland school teams and the Interscholastic Sailing Association, and we've qualified to participate in the Junior Varsity State Championship every single year. Um, this year, we're sending two sailors to the Mid-Atlantic Laser National Qualifier. Um, this is significant, and it, it greatly impacts the, the reputation of our school and our community. The team is requesting that it be recognized as an official team sport and funded to retain our current level one trained and certified sailing coach and hire an additional level one trained and certified coach. Uh, the benefits of doing this would be e extremely significant, would have a huge impact on our school and our, and, and our individuals. Uh, based on our research, other uh, high school sport teams of comparable size are receiving monetary support and we're hopeful our team will too. In advance, uh, we appreciate very much your time and consideration of our request. Um, we do have a packet of information that we're going to provide to each of the board members, um, a letter that we have sent to other school officials, as well as pictures of the team, uh, the JV Championship Spring Regatta results showing how we finished in that um, regatta, uh, a description of the Interscholastic Sailing Association, um, our financial information, and also a recent article that was published on 10 socio-emotional benefits of sailing. Um, so we'll provide that to you, but at this time, I would like if uh, Doug McDonald, one of our sailors, could say a few words. So Doug. Hi, I'd like to thank you guys ahead for your time. Uh, my name is Douglas MacDonald and I am captain of the Kent Island Sailing Team. And I'd just like to tell you a little bit of my experience on the team. I started in eighth grade, which also helps us because it gives the kids an earlier chance at the high school level to help learn 
because it takes a lot of time to learn the basics of sailing. And I've learned very well from the team, and I've had a lot of time to catch up and prepare myself for all of the events that go on, to face the schools that have been doing this for a long time, and to have success from it. I'd also like to talk about the teamwork because we all come together when it comes to the boats. There are two people in each boat and they have to work together, work hard to strive and complete the races. Um, it takes a lot of guts because the boats themselves are, oh my gosh, I'm very sorry. That's okay. Good job. That's doing a great job. No question. That's all right. <laughs> i just like to say, my time on the team has been amazing. The people that have supported us have been amazing. The other schools that have done this are very amazing, and they've been very, very helpful for all of the teams. I'm just glad that we have this opportunity presented to me at the time that I could be able to do this. And for all of the people who can do this, it's just really awesome. And oh my gosh, I'm sorry. Doug, where yes? do you live? I live um, on Kent Island in Stevensville. Okay, I just want to make sure we make that for our notes. Okay. Oh, yeah, that's right. You did a great job. It was wonderful. Yeah, it's, okay. Okay. It's, it's fine. Thank you, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Take a nice deep breath, and thank you for speaking for your group. Thank you for having my time. You're quite welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Next um, person signed up to speak is Richard McNeil. Thank you. You want to go out and go sailing. <laughs> Good evening again. My name is Richard McNeil. Um, start off with I want to say thanks to the board for the continued commitment to maintain the level of health care coverage for our retirees. And uh, I know that's an expense that is important. Uh, for you all as you work through your budget, but it's also important for all the retirees that, uh, since that is one of the large, large chunks of money that is needed each month. Um, this is the month of the childhood cancer awareness. We just heard that suicide uh, week is next week. And, um, you know, we, we are part of this purple uh, thing about opiates and heroin, which has taken over our county and probably the nation. The life skills program that we, that's delivered by Ms. Christine uh, Webster is an important structured curriculum that exposes young teens in the middle school to making good, healthy decisions and to the possible consequences of experimenting with alcohol and drugs. And again, as we start the third year of that, and I monitor that for the University of Colorado, uh, I think it's important that, again, I, I've said this, that we as a, as a board and as a school system really get behind that and support that, and, and you have. Uh, it's, it's really a challenge for her to get around to the different middle schools, but she's doing a great job. And again, if you haven't seen one of those uh, lessons, uh, I would encourage you sometime throughout the year to uh, stop in when she's teaching those lessons. <laughs> and see how the kids really get engaged in it. Um, I know that the, through the University of Colorado at Boulder, their background in that is that there's lifelong uh, residual effects as opposed to some other programs. And of course, that's why we hope that these uh, young teens as they go through the program and get experience with that makes a difference in the long run. And more than anything, you know, whatever we can do to encourage parents to keep the lines of communication open because I think that in some cases, parents forget to keep in touch with their children, and especially as they get older. They think they're independent and we let them go. Uh, but it's very, very important to know what your children are doing, what they're doing on social media and what their, who their friends are and what they're hanging around with, especially after school and on weekends. Another comment on, on opening of schools, I've been just in a little, I haven't been to all of them, but the ones that I've been to was a smooth opening. And we all know that good planning on the part of a teacher is critical to a structured lesson in the classroom. And likewise, good planning is very important to opening schools. And it starts with maintenance, 
transportation, school uh, student services, building leadership and teachers. And I think it's it's behooves us to say thanks to Dr. Kane and, and her leadership team who feeds that out to make sure that our students are ready um, when they walk through the doors and uh, and it keep them safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mr. Bob Simmons. Um, my name is Bob Simmons, and uh, I live in Centerville and was here uh, last month talking about the Kerwin Report and would like to continue that. Last month, I gave you some background on the Commission on Innovation and Excellence in Education and its preliminary report called the Kerwin Report. The summary page of the report shows the committee has chosen nine building blocks for a world-class education system and on the same page in the left-hand column, arranges them by five major policy areas. At the top of the main policy area column is early childhood education. To the right of it, it's building block one, provide strong supports for children and their families before students arrive at school. On the left of the policy column, it says, ample supply of highly qualified and diverse teachers and school teachers. And on the right building block, five, assure an abundant supply of highly qualified teachers. Six, redesign schools to be places in which teachers will be treated as professionals with incentives and support to continuously improve their professional practice and the performance of their students. And eight, create a leadership development system that develops leaders at all levels to manage such systems effectively policy area, college and career readiness pathways, building blocks. Three, develop world-class, highly coherent instructional systems. Four, create clear gateways for students through the system, set to global standards with no dead ends. And seven, create an effective system of career and technical education and training. Policy, more research resources for at-risk students. Building block. Two, provide more resources for at-risk students than for others. Policy. Governance and accountability. Building block. Nine, institute a governance system that has the authority and legitimacy to develop coherent, powerful policies and is capable of implementing them at scale. There are a lot of great ideas in this proposal, but there is no unanimity among the authors of it, and particularly not among the legislatures who will write the laws enabling it. There is lots of opportunities for us, the citizens of the state living near Annapolis, to learn about this proposed plan and influence our legislators and other state le legislators as well to give us a better education for the dollars they're going to spend not just pile more dollars on a subpar framework. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak? That closes our public comment. So at this time, we'll move on to presentations. Dr. Keene, at this time, will you introduce your presentations? Absolutely. We will start with our uh, report on um, readiness for school opening and of course this year again our board meeting fell on um, a day right after school opened so we're still going to share with you our preparedness and uh, things that we can look forward to for this um, school year so we have mr paluski and we also have mr michael bell our um, new supervisor for so many things so we've got fine arts we've got media services in there we've got how, what else do we have in there he corrected me one day we were we were talking to a group and there are so many titles he has uh, so he, he'll, he'll be in there with the bridge to excellence but uh, for now we've got my exec team so mr. Pender mr. Paluski mr. Fister and mr. Farley three P's and Farley yes <laughs> three P's and an F 
<laughs> wow. Sorry. <laughs> Good evening. Good. good evening, President DiMaggio, Vice President George, Board Members Mrs. Harlow, Captain Kelly, Mrs. O'Connor, and Superintendent Dr. Kane. For the record, my name is Craig Paluski, <coughs> Deputy Superintendent, and I'm honored for our executive team members to share with you this evening our opening of schools report for the 2018-2019 school year. Joining me this evening are my colleagues, Mr. Sid Pinder, Chief Operating Officer, Mr. Mark Farley, Director of Human Resources, and Mr. John Fister, our Chief Financial Officer. The purpose of uh, this report is to update and communicate with you, as well as our entire community, key aims from the Departments of Curriculum Instruction, School Operations and Management, Human Resources, and Budget and Finance. We'll begin with the areas that are under my responsibility. Instructional leadership. A key component for a successful school year started at our two-day June Leadership Institute. On day one, all of our school leaders and teams and central office staff work with consultants, Dr. Lamar Shields and Dr. Marina Gilmore, on a teaching and learning equity continuum uh, to embed equity and cultural proficiency work in our schools. On day two, all of our school leaders, teams work together with our central office staff to unpack their data from the 17-18 school year while conducting root cause analysis to identify gaps in student learning with a focus on equity. Teams work on updating their school improvement plans, identifying key strategies to put in place for this coming, coming school year, strategic professional development plans to support classroom teachers with improving teaching and learning. Finally, each of our teams received extensive professional development from our consultant, Dr. Rotunda Floyd Cooper, on the data-wise improvement process, a collaborative data inquiry process to drive improvement in teaching and learning. In addition, this year, we identified four focus schools that will receive intense additional coaching on creating equity teams, which include Southersville Elementary School, Queen Anne's County High School, Stevensville Middle School, and Mattapique Elementary School. Each principal and members of the leadership team had an opportunity to work with Dr. Shields and Dr. Gilmore on the first days uh, beginning of school on a variety of coaching days that will also be built throughout the school year. Also this year, both of our high schools will work with Equal Opportunity Schools, an organization that supports, set supports increasing equitable enrollment in advanced placement and honors classes so more students can simply excel. Another key element was our three-day uh, August Leadership Institute with all of our school leaders and teams receiving professional development on a variety of topics, uh, which included our instructional expectations, our observation and value and monitoring tools, curriculum updates, school disciplines, cultural proficiency, school safety and security, human resource budget and finance and operations. These leadership institutes are essential for a successful opening of school year. Finally, this year, we welcome one new assistant principal at Centerville Middle School, Mr. Sean Barnum, and one new supervisor of visual and performing arts, world and classical languages and media, Mr. Michael Bell. Both these individuals are doing an exceptional job in their new roles, and we look forward to their leadership this year. Curriculum Instructional Tools and Assessment is outlined in the 2016 Curriculum Management Audit. A key focus was to develop aligned, high-quality curriculum documents for teachers to follow. This summer, a, dyn a dynamic and dedicated curriculum instructional supervisor team led multiple curriculum writers and revised over 57 different curricular documents. These documents are key in providing teachers with clear expectations and standards to teach, options to deliver, and obviously multiple ways to assess student learning, all key, all key ingredients to student learning. Also, our supervisors work with our writing teams to advise our, a variety of assessments to accelerate the, uh, and measure learning. Our curriculum writing teams embedded technology tools, strategies to support teachers, and options on how to deliver particular standard in ways in order to differentiate. Materials of instruction. One of the major new in, uh, materials of instruction that was adopted in 1819 school year is for grades 6 through 8 middle school science. The Issues in Science series adopted by the Science Education for Public Understanding program which is related at the University of California, Berkeley. This program, very interactive and engaging, is a great opportunity for students to learn and engage in the next generation science standards. Two other key areas of new materials of instruction include United States History, Spanish One, and French One. All of our teachers were provided professional development on these new materials. Instructional technology students in grades five through eight will receive new Chromebooks this year. An improved maintenance package has been purchased should significantly improve the durability, 
cover repairs, and reducing the time to repair damaged Chromebooks. The Chromebook insurance will be provided at no cost to our families, and the protective case will eliminate the need for a computer bag. The updated technology plan incorporates a lease agreement and provides an opportunity to lease new devices over a four-year rotation. Each middle school will have over 60 new loaners, and each elementary school and fifth grade class will receive 15 new loaners as well. School improvement. This year we continue with all of our schools and our leadership teams to incorporate our second year of our, super mon our superintendent monitoring visits that will, that will take place twice a year. The purpose of each visit is to continue to monitoring school improvement and strategies and the alignment between the principal and the teacher SLOs to further unpack their data to improve student learning in a variety of key areas in which we'll talk about later in the next presentation. With that said, um, Ms. Pauls, our Program Director of Teaching and Leadership Development, will be instrumental in monitoring visits and providing direct support to all of our schools through her supervision of all principals this school year. Finally, in professional development, this year we welcomed 40 new teachers, which is exciting. Ms. Pauls, Ms. Bridget Passan, and Ms. Susan Walbert, both supervisors, uh, had a variety of uh, weeks of activities, onboarding activities for all of our new teachers as well as our supervisors. Our talented pool of new teachers entering our organization adds a level of excitement to support our next generation of QACPS teachers. And finally, August 28th and 29th, uh, the Department of Curriculum Instruction provided over 60 different professional development sessions to all of our teachers and instructional support staff, principals, assistant principals, and academic deans. Topics included curriculum, modeling lessons, assessments, and new strategies, all in an effort to close gaps in learnings. In summer, we're off to an outstanding start to the 18-19 school year, and I look forward to supporting the great work that is taking place in our schools each and every day by our teachers, our administrators, our supervisors, and our support staff. Good evening, board members. Dr. Kane. my name is Sid Pender. I'm Chief Operating Officer for Queen Anne's County Public Schools. And I just want to touch base on some of the areas that I cover um, and give you some highlights of uh, some accomplish accomplishments this summer. Um, with the summer maintenance construction projects, we had Graysonville Elementary School, which opened up on time with the sixth classroom addition. If you get a chance, it is beautiful. Um, Ms. Carla Pullen did a great job with that. It also has a new playground, uh, basketball court outside. We've been very, very pleased with that. Um, we've also had Sellersville Elementary School we are currently uh, replacing the exterior doors. Um, we are also replacing the flat roof. Th both of those <coughs> projects are just about done. Um, and keep in mind that the funding becomes available July 1st. So by the time that you get the funding and then get the contract signed and get on the contractor's you know, timeline, things are gonna push back into the school year. So it's not always gonna be complete before school starts. Um, Ken Allen High School has a much needed uh, phone system that we installed in there. They were having a lot of issues communicating with that. Along with um, Queen Anne's County High School had the last portable that we leased. We were able to remove that portable that has been there for many, many, many years um, and replace it with one that we owned at Graysonville Elementary School. So now we own all, I believe it's 32 portables. Um, we do not lease any of them. Along with that, if you go to um, Queen Anne's County High School, their gym floor was uh, sanded down completely, repainted, refinished, and I tell you, it looks it looks beautiful. Great. It it um, really stands out. We did that a few years ago at Ken Island High School. We were able to put Jody Hyde's signature back on there and add a few other components to help out with the phys physical education classes. Also, that was a, a great accomplishment. Um, Centerville Middle School got a new lunch line. Bayside Elementary School, we try to remove as much carpet as we can from the buildings. And that was the last two main hallways that we had that had carpet in there. And we were able to remove that and uh, put tile in. And it, it not only is it better air quality, but it looks fabulous. Uh, very nice job by Carla Pullen. Um, along with that, we were able to do a, a few small painting projects at Queen Anne's County High School, Sellersville Elementary, Kent Island High School, and kind of spread that out. We still have a lot of projects coming up with the facility assessment money that we received that we'll be you know, getting into. Um, so I want to give a shout out to Jim O'Donnell and his maintenance crew. I mean, and Carla Pullen, wonderful job. Um, it's not easy because we only had 34 days this uh, summer, 34 working days to get the better buildings clean and ready to go. Since I've been in this position, that's the l lowest amount of days we've ever had. 
Um, normally we have around 39, 41, 43 sometimes. So it was really crunch time. Uh, David Carter and his uh, custodial crew cleaned 1.4 million square feet. Um, and I'll say this, each year there's more and more programs that occur in the school. And it's, it's tough, you know, because one, you're trying to get the building ready for the upcoming school year, but two, you know, you still have the uh, summer school ESY occurring. We were able through some capital funding to purchase uh, for next year some um, orbital scrubbers where we will no longer have to use the stripper and the harsh chemicals that put off the fumes. So it will be all water-based um, and be able to be just as efficient without using um, the chemicals. So that's also going to help us out with having activities in the school and not trying to separate different areas. Um, along with that, in athletics, we have had the same athletic handbook for many, many years, and it has really needed to be refurbished and upgraded. And a lot of the documents were in different places, and we were able to this summer with um, Dave Wagner, the AD at uh, Queen Anne's County High School, and Dan Harding at Ken Island High School to actually come through and put the documents all in um, one package so that it flows now and it tells what the coach's responsibilities are. It tells what the coach's evaluations are. This week, for the first time and, and that I can remember, we've had uh, two days where we've had the heat index up around 105. Very easy, we're monitoring it, good at handbook. What does the uh, regulations procedure say? Um, I can't say enough about that document that uh, we've created. Transportation, um, Margaret Ellen um, Kalvinovich and her staff have done a tremendous job getting the buses uh, ready and up and going. I will say that, um, knock on wood, the uh, first two days have been very uh, smooth. Tomorrow will be our, our big day with uh, pre-K and K. You know, there's always a glitch there where, um, you know, maybe mom or dad aren't home or, you know, you have 10 pre-K kindergarten classes coming out to get on one bus at Ken Island Elementary School, making sure all those children are on the correct bus. So tomorrow will be the big test, but I'm, I'm confident in what we've done. For school safety and security, I'm going into my 25th year, for 25th year here at Queen Anne's County Public Schools. And I'll probably say um, this part has been the most rewarding. And <coughs> we did training this summer um, with the Queen Anne's County Sheriff's Department and Department of Emergency Services. And I, I want to kind of throw out a few names here. Uh, Joe Sabori uh, with the Queen Anne's County Sheriff's Department um, came and has a wealth of knowledge. He retired from the Maryland State Police and his specialty is in school safety security. Um, that's what he traveled the state doing. And then with DES, we had Assistant Chief Scott Wheatley and um, Lieutenant uh, Greg, Par uh, Greg Harrison, who was their tactical paramedic. And I also want to thank Dr. Kane and, and Mr. Paluski for making that a priority and giving us the time um, during the first two weeks of school. Because each day, what we did, um, we broke it down so every employee um, had this along with substitutes. So we have about 1,300 uh, employees that were trained in this. I'm talking bus drivers, substitutes, custodians. Um, so we try to specialize and look at, say, the Sodexo kitchen staff, you know, making them aware of potential threats also taking and how are they going to respond to a, pretend, a potential threat um, and then stop the bleeding. And so each day was dedicated to a different group because obviously the kitchen staff is going to have a few more different items in there. Um, and I, I got to say, God bless Miss Branham. I think she's 83 years old and she pulled out her little pin knife to show us that <laughs> what she carried with us. So I, I told her to put that away. That was great, but we would look at that later. Um, but we really focused on specializing, you know, for the secretaries. They're going to be the first ones that are contacting 911. So we had the 911 center come in, review with them how they're going to respond to the questions being asked. But Joseph Bory, um, I, I cannot say enough about him and what he's done for us. The, um, the awareness piece, the uh, behavioral analysis, looking at trends, the mental health aspect of it. Um, and then, you know, what are we going to do when it happens? Um, we've changed the way we do things. It used to be everybody lined up against the wall, um, and that's what they told us to do. Now it's, hey, if you can get out, get out. But how can you secure the door to get yourself out? Um, you know, we're looking at uh, ladders to get down on the sides, um, those types of things. And then the last part of it was the hemorrhage control piece. And we met with Dr. Ciatola, um, 
Chief Scott Haas, Assistant uh, Chief uh, Scott Wheatley, and came up with a packet, a bag, that has a hemorrhaging control kit. It's the same exact kit that they have, they carry, and the, the paramedics carry. And if you look about five years ago, uh, Dr. Ciatola installed the, um, the bleeding kits, two of them are in each school, which are great. They're in the hallway and one's in the cafeteria. But if there's an active shooter, or active assailant going on, we're not going to be able to get to those um, cases. It's going to be the people in the classroom that, you know, bleed out and die. So we trained 1,300 people on how to apply a tourniquet. Um, and I'll say they had, they brought the mannequin in and they got to actually put the tourniquet on. Not every group did. It was a little hard with having 500 teachers or 400 in one group and 300 in another. Um, but A&S got to do that. Um, some of the custodians got to do that. And um, Sodexo Food Service got to do that. And, and I'll tell you, what I took away from that, I mean, I, I sat for two weeks going through this presentation and each day I learned something. And, and the one thing that I learned out of it the most is the things that we're doing here, you can take home and use at home. The tourniquet, I mean, was just amazing. Um, you know, how to defend, you know, with the active assailant, those types of things. And Joe did a nice job of putting a little personal touch to it, not getting so deep, but just kind of, you know, keeping it so that everybody, uh, you know, felt comfortable with it. We were able to take it one step further with um, the ANS team where we were at Queen Anne's County High School. We um, went through different scenarios of how you would respond, how you would barricade, um, and then how, how you could evacuate. And I, I think it opened up a, a lot of eyes um, to how quickly things occur. We actually had live gunfire sounds going on um, so that, you know, everybody thinks that it's just going to happen and everybody's going to respond but it's going to be muscle memory and how quickly you react um and that debriefing afterwards I, I think really shed a lot of light on what we're doing that's good um and what we need to do to improve on so i will say um we are working on the uh, mview where the police have access to our cameras that should be up and finished up and running by uh, christmas winter break and uh, will be the second school system in the state for that. And then we are the first school system in the state to have every classroom have the, um, the tourniquet bag. So with that being said, those will be in um, the middle of September and we'll put those in the classroom. But like I said, <clears throat> I think that in my 25 years was probably the most <clears throat> sorry, rewarding two weeks that I've had. Um, I want to also, the school resource officers, we are very fortunate uh, Sheriff Hoffman has um, put in his budget to hire four additional school resource officers. We have two, one at each high school, all right? What we did with the other four, they were able to get three, basically. Um, the fourth one, they're having some shortage of officers and deputies finding them, because it takes a special person to be an SRO. It's just not your average police officer off the street. Um, so what we did, we took one SRO is dedicated to Mattapique Elementary School, Mattapique Middle School, and Graysonville. That's their area. Those are the only schools they go to. Then we took a second one, Stevensville Middle School, Bayside Elementary School, and Ken Island Elementary School. The third one we have up north <coughs> at Settlersville uh, Middle, Churchill Elementary, and Settlersville Elementary. And then currently, while we're waiting for the fourth one to add, we have Centerville PD handling the uh, Centerville Elementary, Kennard Elementary, um, and Centerville Middle School. And the reason we grouped them like that, we were looking at feeder schools so that those deputies could build relationships with those students going from, say, Churchill to Sellersville Middle School and move on. Um, that has gained a lot of support. Uh, the principals seem very you know, gracious for that, and, and I'm thankful to uh, Sheriff Hoffman and, and Dr. Kane for helping us out with that. So with that being said, there's still a lot more to do, but it was a, a very busy and, and hectic summer. And I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Farley, I believe. Good evening. I'd like to share with you that we've had some changes in our direction, our strategic direction for human resources. Um, I don't think my updated slides made it in here, but um, I, I'm pleased to share that uh, really a commendation for um, 
Mr. Pinder and Carla, uh, we were able to write a grant to convert from our um, badge pass system to the T-Pass system. And that gentleman came in during our training and uh, educated the, the uh, secretaries on how it runs. The older system wasn't really functioning well. And this new one creates great capacity for letting everybody in a building know if there's an evacuation, including a visitor, um, and a really much improved security protocol for visitors. So I, I really want to thank Mr. Pinder and the operations department as a whole for teaming up on this important improvement. And the bulk of it was paid through grants. So with regard to, um, with regard to recruitment, uh, it's our commitment to advertise <coughs> teacher and administration positions in a way that results in greater diversity in our applicant pool, as well as growing our own people uh, through uh, emphasis on advanced certifications, uh, additional professional development coursework, to ensure that we have a cadre of leaders that are diverse, just as we want a cadre of teachers that are diverse. So we'll be trying out some new methodologies of advertising and training throughout the course of the year. We will rely more heavily on a series of online courses that the executive team is currently vetting. So we'll probably spend the rest of the fall vetting all these courses. And when we find those that are particularly effective, we'll find ways to roll it out for support employees, for them to do it during the course of their work day. They're not very long courses, most of them about 20 minutes. Um, but we hope to begin to shape the culture thoughtfully and strategically <coughs> in a way that improves our ability to deliver education for all students and to be a welcoming culture for all employees, administrators, uh, in the way that our that our superintendent, our board, our executive team all want. Um, with that, um, I would simply say that <coughs> we will create a cultural metric um, where we want 100% of our folks to have been trained in certain things like harassment, discrimination, emphasis on policies and policy rollout that helps people understand not only their legal obligations, but the benefit of cultural equity in our school. So that's, that's about it for now. Thank you, Mr. Maggio, Dr. Kane, members of the board. I just wanted to share a few things of what I consider uh, some of the foundational things from a school system standpoint. I consider us sort of the bricks and the mortar that are holding everything else up. Um, we had our first, we'll well have our first payroll on Friday. 1,091 employees will receive their paycheck after some of the, you know, the, all the retirements, the resignations, all the new employees um, without a hiccup. And I, I, I need to send kudos out to my team um, and also Mr. Farley's team because that's a lot of work over the summer with all the people leaving, all the people coming in. Uh, we had an open enrollment. We're getting all of those balances. And all of that culminated into what uh, employees will see this Friday uh, in their paycheck. Um, so kudos to that team. Um, as far as school budgets, uh, the schools have been informed of what their budget is for this year. And uh, my team and I will be working ever so closely with the schools to get a better understanding of how their resources are being used, uh, what we can do to support them, um, even to make sure that things such as uh, how they're handling their school checking accounts, uh, making sure that um, you know they do spend those funds this year because that's what it's intended for, or the kids that are in their, their building, uh, the children that, that are in their building this year. So we're going to work closely with them to make sure that uh, we provide the support necessary to make sure that we have a successful uh, rollout there. Uh, financial audit, that's underway by state law. The statements will be issued on September 30th, so that's been a busy summer uh, project for us as well. And then finally, we'll be working with MSDE and developing a statewide model. Um, all of the CFOs from all of the counties have been working with MSDE over the last year to develop a statewide model because the new as a requirement will require that school level um, spending be published on the MSDE website so you will be able to see exactly per pupil per school um, the spending there and there is a model that we've been uh, working with to develop with all the other counties because we all do our fine finances differently as far as our financial systems are concerned. Some of us charge benefits to the employee level, some 
just aggregately. Um, so we have to come up with a model that adequately uh, reflects the spending um, so we can make sure that we have you know, adequate data out there. And that's about it <coughs> for us. Thank you. Thank you, team. And I'd just like to thank each of you because it is a phenomenal amount of work, I recognize, but you have awesome teams that surround you and support you and make sure that our employees and our students get what they need. So thank you. Thank you each. Um, and I'd like to open up for questions for, from our board members. question. <laughs> Mr. Pender, here we go with doors again. Sorry. <laughs> Are we getting doors for here, secure doors yes, so for here? I believe it's September 23rd. Um, we will start work here and there will be a secure vestibule at the front where somebody will be buzzed in they'll be locked into that vestibule then they'll share their credentials and all that then they'll be buzzed in to the actual building okay all the other perimeter doors will be only by card uh, proximity card so um, that was the last piece to the um, right now they're doing cellars with elementary school doors right. and then once that's complete they'll be here and, about, I think it was September 23rd or 24th okay. was the date it's supposed to start. I'm just curious as to that, that it's being question. done. Yep. So. Is this staff getting, like, like Jackie and getting the training so for? In September, towards the latter part, we're going to do the, the training here for that, for okay. Board of Ed also. Sid, how are the SROs going to be shared between their three schools, basically, that they're going to be covering at the middle just and elementary on a level? on a rotational basis. Um, day to day? Yeah, it would be every day that students are in the building. Um, and I've asked for them to, you know, <coughs> they're not there to direct traffic. I mean, they're there for school security and to build those relationships with, with the students. So will they spend a whole day in one school and then go on to the next, the next, or three? They're going to divide it up during the day. In that day. In that okay. day, yep. Okay. So we're kind of fortunate because, say, at Stevensville Middle School, it opens earlier than Bayside and Ken Island. So, you know, that time is kind of crucial having somebody there when people are coming through the doors. So having that deputy leave from there, then go to the two elementary schools, you know, is kind of a win-win for us. Um, you know, right now the state with the, uh, they're new, the 2018 uh, school safety um, bill that was passed, they require you to have one in every high school. They don't require you yet to have one in every school. Right. And if you don't have one in every high school, they want you to have a plan uh, that is basically for sufficient coverage. Um, and we're, we've, we're ahead of the ball game. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're very fortunate to have those, those three SROs, um, when, especially when they're short on staff there. So uh, we appreciate that. Mr. Paluski, how are the four schools that were chosen for your module chosen? Sure. Sorry, sir. Well, one, we, t we took a variety of, of factors into consideration. One in leading any initiative starts with a leader. So that was one certain thing that, that we took a look at. Uh, one, to be able to get buy-in uh, from that individual leader that's going to be working with those schools. Um, the second thing is we had to look at schools that had already started this work. You know that this isn't this isn't anything new as far as our work around equity. Some schools are further along than others. So that's a factor that we had to take a look into when we worked with the Campbell Joneses a, a few years before and we started this work. Uh, so we felt that these four schools um, had a little bit of a, of a jump start, so to speak. Uh, the leadership would be a second issue. Um, and I think the third issue that you know, sometimes when there are equity issues that come up and, and rise to our attention. And I think, you know, those are other factors that we had to take into consideration. Okay, thank you. Mr. Fister, I had a couple questions that have actually been queried by a member of the community. Um, I know that the, um, the association dues are, when people join the association, they pay dues. Those that choose not to join have to pay a fee um, because they benefit from the decisions the association makes. Um, but there was a recent Supreme Court decision where they were no, no longer, they were actually required, I think, to um, pay that fee. They no longer are required to pay that fee. That's My correct. question is, has that come out of, it? We, the, our school system automatically deducts that money from their pay. And I just wonder if, You've had the process of asking them if they want to 
be a member of the union or does the union do that or how do we work that so, so that our employees can get their money if they're entitled to it by now? So those, deduct those deductions don't come out until November of every year. I think it's 14 pays. November through June is when those deductions <coughs> come out. And I, what you're referring to is agency fees, and we are no longer allowed to collect agency fees. So we were working with the unions uh, that we've received some um, some new paperwork for some of the new teachers to join the union, and then there have been some people who have submitted paperwork that um, they no longer want uh, any type of deduction. But as far as those that have agency fees, nothing's required of them because we, we will not deduct that. If they want to change that agency fee into a deduction, they would have to go through the union to submit us their paperwork. Okay, well, and just for the sake of the union, I want to make sure they're, um, they're notified um, and hooked in with the union because they may decide, yeah, I, I like what I was getting with the fee. I'd like to join the union now. That would be. Yeah, they would work directly with the union if they wanted to decide Cause, that. Because some people just don't know, yeah. I think. Yeah, they would need to work directly with the union, and I think the union has made some outreach to new teachers and things like that. Okay. Captain Kelly, the language in the collective bargaining agreement was called representation fee. Yes, representation. And that was deleted from the collective bargaining agreement by mutual agreement in the wake of the Janus decision. Right. I just wasn't sure if it was hap it happened this year then. Yes. So, okay. Um, and then I had one other question that was inquired by another person um, that you said the financial audit is underway, but I was they were under the impression that it was already done. And, Okay, it's going so to be addressed by the The one press. thing that I didn't address was the legislative audit that was going on for a year that did complete this year. Um, and I, th I think I sent all the board members a link to that report. Um, it's out on the um, legislative audit as, uh, auditor's website. What I'm referring to is our annual external auditor goes through our financial you know, and, and comes up with our financial statements and everything like that. That's required by June 30th. That is not done. So required we did by have what? two. June 30th? I'm sorry, September 30th. Oh, okay. um, there are two audits that we did this year. Well, we go through multiple audits, but I think the one you're referring to, the one that is done, is a legislative audit that um, we had responses to them. I think it's dated August 4th or something like that. But this financial review here okay. is our annual. We go through it every summer. And well, maybe I missed it, but were we briefed on the results of that legislative audit? Yes, ma'am. We were okay. Just I recently. I mean, you just recently sent us the just the sent link. Uh -huh. Okay, but it hasn't. We haven't done a presentation. We haven't to done the public. Not a Okay. No, we haven't done a presentation for the public, but the audit that you're referencing, the one that we are in the midst of, that's the one we usually get the report around January springtime. Yes. And they come and do that presentation. Yeah, but this was one someone said was already done. Yeah. Legislative the audit legislative is done, but the current one that what you saw that was all that's in process is the other external audit. Okay. So in the um, um, in one of our future soon future meetings. I, I would like us to Absolutely. brief that, please, the legislative one that's been I've done. Never seen that. um, and Mr. Poluski, just one last thing is, Mr. Simmons has, makes a point, you know, briefing us, you know, of, on the Kerwin report, and it, ex I mean, extremely complicated. Do we have a, some kind of a, a individual designated to, to be up on that too? And, and because our board will need, possibly need some advice as to the the goal. I think of Mr. Simmons is. We have to get engaged with our with our people in in, in, the, yeah. in Annapolis and, and encourage them. No, school system, school districts don't have a person who is uh, appointed, you know, to do that work. The superintendents have a representative on on that um, on one of the committees. Um, I believe that the commissioners may have a representative that is a part of maybe a subcommittee. Um, so there are various people, whether it's educators or. Um, um, our political leaders that are involved in that work. And so, yeah, so one of the things you could do is, is to contact a political leader. Superintendent's group has already uh, written a letter to um, the commission expressing our thoughts and, and what we thought we might be able to support, and one of which, of course, is it's different in every district because take, for example, the early childhood that Mr. Um, Simmons spoke about. You, you, you know, everybody wants to ensure that we have appropriate early childhood education, um, and some districts are 
able to do universal pre-K and, and those kinds of things, and some have an issue with space, as we would. Um, and so that would represent an unfunded mandate. There's a fiscal impact for those kinds of things. So superintendents have, you know, and various groups have supported one facet or another of, of the Kerwin Commission. That work, as you know, continues to be underway. It was delayed for some time, um, but they've met again and they've started to meet once again. Once again, the superintendent's group last week submitted um, a, uh, a letter in support or not in support of certain facets of that. Um, it was a very quick turnaround, maybe about uh, four or five days that they needed that as we were opening schools. So we don't know what's going to become of those recommendations. Uh, they are due to have a report to everyone in um, December of this year. So we shall see. Well, on the uh, being on the legislative committee with May, they discussed that, and I'll try to bring things back to the board to where letters we may may want to submit. They are they're periodically ask for um, all of us as all the districts in Maryland to to write letters each each individual board um, in support of some of the initiatives that they're so I'll keep an ear out for mm -hmm. ones that we could we could participate in as far as you know trying to, to get the information to our, our legislative um, folks and and once I have it I will share the letter from um, the superintendent's group Pazam yeah that would be great. once we have it mm -hmm. okay we meet next week so hopefully we'll have it then okay and this year I would hope that we could be a little more active with meeting with our our uh, legislative folks in Annapolis um, so there are opportunities yeah. that come up yeah. and we have not as much and then hopeful we can do it in the that, future. That would be great because our superintendents, we met with them quite frequently and um, we were on a um, monthly lunch. We had lunch with them monthly and we went down several times so we were able to maintain those kinds of contacts so that was good. It would be awesome if our school board could do the same. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I did have one question if that's okay. Um, it has to do with the school resource officers, and I'm glad, you know, that we have three, soon to be four. And the question I'm often asked is, you know, can we get more? And it's always, I think, about financial resources. Right now, those salaries are coming out of the sheriff's budget. Is that correct? correct okay. Yes. If we were to move in a direction of adding more, what do other counties do? Are they often funded through sheriff's departments, or do the Board of Ed being... Um, the folks that are benefiting in some way contributed financially to these positions. I, I just don't know how other counties have it lined up and what we would be looking at in the future, budget-wise. Some, some are solely provided by the police department or the sheriff's department. Some um, do have a hybrid of they might pay for one, the school board might pay for one, and then the county um, sheriff's department pays for another. So there's there's different models out there, mm -hmm. but for the most part, I'd say that it's uh, paid for by the um, you know the law enforcement. Uh, you know, it's coming out of their budget. Um, but I do know there are a few. I want to say a few smaller counties that um, share that cost with them, or some even look at it as in, hey, we're paying for them while they're here for 180 days. The other part of it, you take care of it because they still have you know, in the summertime obligations to take care of. So it's kind of a mixture, but most of it is paid for through, um, you know, the law enforcement because they're, they're employees, so. When there was money, I think that was talked about um, coming from the state to help with school sa safety, is, is that an option to funnel some of that into some of these positions in the future? Is that a way that that money would get used? <coughs> there, there's two pieces to that. One is like the, the fixed piece of you know construction wise how to upgrade and then the other part is um, different assessments that you can do the uh, mental health part of it I'm not quite sure I have to go back and look at it uh, I'll be honest with you the the specs on it aren't really written um, you know very thorough so it it kind of comes across but I'll, I can look into that and see if that is something the only thing about that is once that grant runs out mm -hmm. then somebody's gonna have to pick up that cost of that uh, that you know how to sustain it right it's not so, but I'll take a look at that yeah I was just a, curious thank you yep. thank you mr. Pender I had a question yes, also. Um, so you were talking about things that happened over the summer um, that had to do with school improvement um, I noticed today that we have a handful of new lockers um, and they look great, but I noticed that they were significantly 
bigger than the ones that we have had previously, um, at least from the looks of it. So I was wondering if it is in the works to replace the old ones with new lockers or if... I don't ha we don't have that in the budget now. Um, that was a request by the principal um, to get more lockers uh, in there. And um, at the time, we went with that size because they were available. Um, the others were about an eight to 12 week turnaround. Gotcha. Um, so that's why there's a different style. We just didn't have time with the students coming back in there for that. So they're additional, they're not replacements. Yep, they're additional, yep. So is that because of increased enrollment? What, uh, the or did we have kids who didn't have lockers and all of a sudden well, now we basic, do? Well, you have, what, what goes on at both high schools, I think Mr. Shirt got still here. At both high schools, a lot of times you have a long distance to get to your locker. Um, and one of the things that uh, Ms. Hudock thought was important was to have the book bags when they come into the school in the lockers. Um, so we looked at it as a safety standpoint um, to try that to see how that would go. So the lockers were installed there so that the kids or students could be clustered better um, with that being said. But it's not due to a, a larger enrollment. Um, it's so did we have kids that didn't have lockers previously? Not at the high school that I'm aware of. I mean, I, I could be wrong on that. Um, you know, I'm just based off of what Ms. Hudock was meeting with me about. Um, so we're trying to eliminate the book bags and, and I get that. those kinds of I get things. That. But, but I don't, I'm not aware of it. If we haven't replaced I, I, and we've added, maybe we just have some that just aren't in a good area to utilize, and these have been put in an, in an area that is more accessible and they can get to class easier. Maybe just not all the lockers are being used now. If you haven't replaced lockers, and we weren't short on lockers, but we've added lockers. And, and one of the other factors is, yes, it was the safety. So all kids weren't, weren't using them. Well, I was going to say right. that. Everybody right. wasn't using them. And then right. we do have students from Ken Island High School that come, and so they will need to put their uh, book bags in and a now locker they as will be well. Able to, yes. Where in the past they probably weren't. Able they, to. Well, a lot of kids just didn't use the lockers. Gotcha. Is the policy at the both at both schools, both high schools? It's not a policy, but no, Kent Island did not find the need to have their kids putting their book bags in a locker, and Queen Anne's County, that's one thing that she wanted to do. So it's not a policy, it's a practice at each school. Okay. Did we, did we, who, I don't know whose question that was. Uh, did those, we answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I kind of tagged on to her. I just want to say one more thing. Uh, I forgot one major item. The solar array at uh, Queen Anne's County High School, Centerville Middle School. Centerville Middle School will be online in about two weeks. Oh, nice. The 1st of October, um, Queen Anne's County High School will be online. And then we actually have enough to net meter down to Ken Island High School. So it's been a long process, but yeah, that within the next three or four weeks will be up and running. So not to change the subject, but. <laughs> no, that's, that's great. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you very thank much, you. team. I think Mr. Pluski is going to stay and we'll ask Mr. Bell to join him so we can share with you our Bridge to Excellence report. And just as a reminder, the Bridge to Excellence report will be shared at the uh, County Commissioner's uh, uh, meeting next week on the 11th. Good evening again. For the record, my name is Greg Pluski, Deputy Superintendent, and joining me is my colleague, Mr. Michael Bell. Uh, who's a supervisor of visual and performing arts, world and classical languages and media. And this evening we are providing you with our annual uh, Bridge to Excellence Master Plan Update. Okay, first I'd like to uh, say good evening to President DiMaggio, Vice President George, all board members and student board members, Dr. Kane. Uh, it's a pleasure to meet some of you for the first time face to face. So uh, I'm excited to be here and uh, I'm here to present and uh, roll out the Bridge to Excellence Master Plan. So I guess we'll get started with uh, our objectives. The main purpose uh, of, of the Master Plan, that's the why. So we're going to break this down for you, uh, this big document, so you can really truly understand it in uh, absolute clarity. We're going to provide an overview of the structure. Uh, that's the what, uh, how the structure is formulated, this document. We're going to share goals, success factors, areas of need, strategies to meet those needs and exceed our goals. Uh, that's really the how. 
And uh, ultimately, our goal is to gain Board of Ed approval on the draft document. So let's start with the why. Uh, the purpose of the overall document began in 2002 when the Maryland General Assembly enacted the Bridge to Excellence in Public Schools Act, which resulted in <coughs> a standards-based approach to school finance. And the Bridge to Excellence legislation then required us as a local school system to develop this comprehensive master plan, uh, which basically is a compliance document. And it outlines strategies for improving student achievement and eliminating achievement gaps. Now, a year later, after that came out, the Maryland General Assembly also enacted the Fiscal Accountability and Oversight Act, which expanded the scope of this master plan annual update. And it also included a detailed summary of how the Board of Education's budget and increases in expenditures over the prior year is consistent with the goals, the objectives, and the strategies uh, detailed within the master plan. So that basically we're all in alignment. We're all, we're all speaking the same language. So lastly, we must also uh, report out on each assessment that is administered. So that's the, basically the purpose of why this document exists. Now we're going to get into the structure. So the structure of the master plan begins with, uh, it's basically a three-part chapters. Uh, executive summary is essentially chapter one, which gets into our budget narrative, um, the goal progress, which leads us into the local, the state, and the federally mandated tests that are taking place uh, in English language arts, literacy, math, government, and so that's essentially part two. And then lastly, part three, that shares specifically which assessments are being administered and the state's requirements, uh, which we will also share as we unpack for you this master plan. So under part one, the executive summary, we've also uh, outlined for you under this three more major parts. Part A, that tackles our strategic goals, our four goals of academic excellence, safe schools, which we, you know, Mr. Pinder talked about at the beginning, uh, high quality workforce, organizational effectiveness. And this leads us into our budget narrative, which gets back to the reflection on expenditures and how they're aligning with the strategic goals. And part C, which is our goal progress highlights. This is where I'm going to turn the show over to our Deputy Superintendent, Mr. Paluski, because this is where the, you know, the highlights, these are great things that uh, we love to tout about the progress that we are making within this master plan. Mr. Paluski. Thank you, Mr. Bell. One thing I just want to clarify for the board is that in this document, which is a compliance document, the only goals that are in here uh, will be English language arts, three to eight, and, and English 10, which is in high school, and mathematics, three through eight, as well as algebra one. What we will be presenting to you at the uh, October 10th board meeting will be our comprehensive review on all of our academic indicators as it relates to goal one. So I just want to make sure that that's clarified that we're going to give you a lot more data and a lot more information, but we wanted to report out some of the highlights. If you uh, recall that last week at the state board meeting, uh, they've lifted the embargo on our, on our park scores across the state. So we wanted to just hit some highlights for you uh, that are embedded within the master plan, uh, and then you'll get a more of a comprehensive review and unpacking of all this data on October 10th. But hit some highlights for you in English language arts, um, the district-wide percentage of students touring a performance level of four or five increased in grades three, four, five, and eight. That's pretty significant. Mattapique Elementary School and Southersville Middle School increased approximately 18 percentage points. 
That's significant. In Southersville Middle School, there was also seeing an increase in grade eight scores on a performance level four or five by more than 50%, 15 percentage points. In English 10, five percentage point increase in the percentage of students scoring at that level uh, and, and now narrowing that to 71.5 percent of our students overall with our overall goal of 80 percent by 2021. 85 percent of our test takers met the requirement, the scaled score and the cohort graduation rate. And for the second year in a row, making some significant progress in narrowing gaps among African-American students at both of our high schools. Uh, Ken Island High School, the percentage of African-American students last year uh, were increased by a percentage of 25 percentage points, and at Queen Anne's increased by more than 13 percentage points. On the areas of mathematics, in grades three through eight, our district-wide percentage of students had increased in grades three, four, five, seven, and eight. Uh, most noted, uh, Kennard Elementary School that had an increase in 11, 11 percentage points. And gaps in farm students was narrowed from six to 10 schools. And special education narrowed from eight to 10 schools. Uh, Algebra one, as you know, which is a graduation requirement, 2.6% 2. 2 of those students increased and the performance level four or five as the district now is at the area 58.7%. And overall 84% of our test takers met the requirement uh, for that cohort's graduation rate. Pretty impressive, 100% of our middle school algebra one test takers met the requirement skilled score uh, for that cohort's graduation requirement. Uh, it's pretty impressive. In the area of government, there was an increase in the pass rate of performance for government in the high school assessment from 87 uh, to 90.2 compared to that 16-17 administration. Uh, and students, African American special education and free and reduced students experienced significant gains, 12.6, 28, and 5.9 respectively as compared to the year before in 16 and 17. One of the things, and again, we'll go into this in more detail on October 10th, but um, the superintendent wanted to ensure, and, and, and we'll share this again, we had compared uh, what this chart shows you is all those, all the data points that are on the left and those assessments. Last year, where we ranked in the state uh, as compared to that assessment, and then where we rank on the Eastern Shore. Um, for those in our audience, there are 24 jurisdictions in the state of Maryland. There are nine of which that we're a part of here on the Eastern Shore. So you can see in the 1718, uh, either where we've increased or improved our ranking, or maybe where our ranking uh, has dropped. Uh, if you look at and, and actually go through the slides in the state report, uh, through across the state, there were decreases in almost uh, half of our school systems in Algebra 1 as well as English 10. Uh, but what this chart shows is that Queen Anne's County Public Schools uh, ranks in the top seven, uh, if not number one, or at least in, in the first one, two, or three on the Eastern Shore. Um, and it doesn't mean that there's not work to do because there is, uh, but there's momentum here in, in which we're certainly building upon. But underneath all of this is the fact that a student achievement gap remains. Uh, and that remains among African-American students, farm students, special education students, as well as English language, English language learner students. And, and Dr. Kane speaks to this um, frequently, and that is when you look at that aggregate score, that overall our school system looks pretty good. However, there are some student populations in which we still need to continue to work in order to meet their individual needs. The last thing uh, that is in the comprehensive uh, master plan is a variety of strategies. And uh, one of the things that we wanted to provide you for you is not to go over all of these strategies with you, but when you look at that report, um, and kudos to all of our curriculum supervisors, certainly Michael, Mr. Bell, who's, who's now come into our school system and has this responsibility, but all of our supervisors are invested in this and, and have a, a lot of comprehensive writing to do, analysis, which strategies are we going to put in place, what strategies are we working with schools to put in place. So I'm not going to read a list of, of, of um, strategies, but overall there's what we continue to call alignment. So alignment with all of our schools, uh, school improvement plans, our principals SLOs that have to target gaps, individual teacher SLOs that target gaps. So there's a whole comprehensive plan here as it relates to improving the all academic achievement uh, of all of our students. And with that said, 
Um, the last part, and as Mr. Bell alluded to, and that is the More Learning, Less Testing Act, which took place a few years ago. Now the, the master plan requires, you'll notice that in the appendix clear at the end, we have to list all of the assessments uh, that we administer within our school system. As part of that, and I'll make a connection to the Innovation Center, uh, Team 5, uh, this was their primary deliverable, and we had worked with focus groups. We sat down with teachers. We looked at all of our assessments. Are there some things that we could eliminate? And based upon that and feedback uh, of their overall support of the assessments that we're providing. So I know as well as you do that this is a large document, and we wanted to provide a little bit of a summary for you this evening. It is a draft document, so if you recall the process, we seek your feedback and approval to send the draft document. Um, to the State Department of Education. Our next step will be to go to the commissioners, the superintendent said, review this with them. Uh, and typically what happens, we'll receive feedback uh, by October. And then if there are any clarifying questions, our supervisor and my staff will have to write those and then we'll submit those back to the State Department to clarify anything. And then that overall master plan will be approved by the State Department. So with that, uh, I know that's a very uh, 30,000 foot view, but we are more than happy to answer any questions that you may have. A question I had was just um, the timeline from when a baseline was developed versus the end result. Was it uh, one year, two years, and was the sample size the same? Yeah, and, and I believe that we're in our fourth year. So when I arrived in, uh, in 15 and 16, we would have got the results from 14, 15. That would have been our baseline year. Um, one of the things that we will share at our October 10th meeting uh, when Mr. Brown and our accountability office, he, his slides are a little bit more pretty so to speak uh, uh, they're, they're more they're more visual but his data slides will show you over time how we've performed since we began to administer the park assessment and what we should see over time is that we're gradually improving towards our, our target and you'll see that in his graphs where the system has set a benchmark that we want to be here and usually in your baseline you're here mm -hmm. and then you're going to start to see where we're making progress overall what you will see is there still remain some significant gaps in those individual student groups. Mm -hmm. But we'll share that visually with you uh, in the next month. Th this data that's here, um, the, the improvements thus to date, is that all from just one assessment or is that all the assessments kind of put together and that data is crunched and that's sure. what those numbers represent? Sure. These are on our, our state and our federal accountability assessments. So those assessments that are administered um, this year it was in um, late Ap April. Um, so in the bigger assessment scheme, our teachers are monitoring and our administrators are monitoring progress all the way through the year until they have to take that larger assessment. But what that is showing you is this moment in time in that academic year, how are those students meeting those standards at that particular grade level in, in reading and mathematics, okay. as well as government. Thank you. I look forward to October 10th and hearing. So do we. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Pulisky. You're Mr. welcome. Bell, any other questions? Mr. Pulisky, when you're, you probably are going to do this in the more detailed presentation. I know Mr. Brown usually does, but when you're talking about percentages, we need to attach that to numbers of kids. Sure. If you say 100% of the middle school algebra one test takers met it, that is awesome, but I don't know what that number is. And how sure. That is, if that is so in, 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 thank you, Captain Kelly, and, and I really appreciate that. At the time that we were working on this presentation, the state board had not lifted the embargo uh, on the state data. They just released that last week, so that's why we had the highlighted the highlights in here, just so you could get an idea. We will certainly do that. We'll, in Mr. Brown's presentation, uh, he'll have the number of students that you'll be able to see overall, the total number, and then it'll be the percentage. So how many, how many students are in a particular student group, and then what that percentage is overall. You'll, you'll be able to see all of that at a higher level of detail. Um, but if you go into this report, uh, you will see the data tables that are, that are broken down a little bit further. <coughs> Yeah, I saw some of that. Um, the, but on the presentation, too, especially when you're dealing with schools and putting specific schools out there, that that makes people look at and compare schools. So 
if we've got some realistic numbers with the schools, you know, that kind of a, a thing I think is very important. The other thing is you, which p piece are you going to be briefing the commissioners on? Um, well, what we'll be doing is essentially presenting uh, to them exactly what we're presenting to you this evening, which is this high-level overview um, of, of what the plan is. Y as you know, the plan is, is many, many pages. Right, so right. to try to break it down and to summarize it so that folks get an idea of what is this document? Why do we have to do it? Uh, what is it? And, and know on the backside that we have a plan in order to move forward and, and implement strategies that we believe that are going to make a difference. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Are our interventions affected by these numbers at all? Because I keep hearing that this intervention has gone away and we don't have it anymore and we really miss it and I want it back. <laughs> How are we making those decisions? Sure, sure, good question. So one of the things that will be shared uh, in, in that data presentation uh, that Mr. Uh, Brown will do is that each of our supervisors will also have a slide and they're gonna go in in great depth uh, into the strategy that we're putting into place. To specifically answer your question, uh, one of the things that our Innovation Center Team 5 has done over the course of this year is to look at all of our interventions. Uh, we've, uh, Mrs. Passan and her, all of our reading specialists, I'll use reading as an example, have done a phenomenal job to say, A, what do we have out there? Who's in it? And how are kids doing? And one of the things that we found internally by our data is that we have kids going in but they're not coming out. The other thing that we found is we have a, what I would call potpourri interventions. They're a little bit of this and it's a, it's a little bit of that. We were just awarded this past year $400,000 on a striving readers grant uh, that each jurisdiction has the opportunity to apply for. We were awarded that grant and one of the things that Mrs. Passon is doing is aligning, strategically aligning our interventions really throughout our entire school system. So one of the things that we'll be piloting is, is Read 180. We've done this at the high school level, but that is a comprehensive intervention for students from grades three to eight. And so what that's gonna get to us to is a, a level of consistency, number one, <coughs> but it all comes back to professional development and being able to implement that intervention with fidelity. And so as we continue to do that, and we'll track that, that what we should see is as kids go into intervention, we should start to see kids coming out of intervention. Some kids just need more. But what we should start to see is a transfer of skills out of the intervention into their core academic class. Interventions are only one piece of the puzzle. The best piece of the puzzle is the classroom teacher being able to, to differentiate, but some kids they just need, they simply need more and we want to be able to provide that what we refer to as tiered systems of intervention so the teacher being the first intervention a tier two system if I'm having a problem in comprehension I might go into that um, when Ms. McShane steps up here shortly she'll talk about tier three so some of our our special ed students uh, that might be in, in decoding that have a severe uh, deficiency uh, they need something different and so what we're trying to do is strate strategically align our interventions um, that we know are research based um, to be able to look at students over time I believe we need a motion to send this to the county commissioners, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay, I make a motion that we send the BTE plan sure. to the county commissioners. Second. Sure. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's a pleasure meeting you. We didn't do that loud. Yeah. Is this one we need to verbalize, dear? Yeah. We're on a little learning curve here. <coughs> we are now going to, I guess I should let an, um, um, explain it. Go right ahead. Uh, we're going to announce our it. votes by name. Jackie will call us as a roll call and we will vote verbally so people actually hear our vote. It's often very difficult, especially for the president when she's running the meeting, to get her vote verbalized as she's also reading her next level of oh, instruction. Oh, this is important uh, legally now. 
that everyone's vote is well understood by the public and the video. Okay. So, Miss, since it was unanimous, this time Miss Wright can just read what was voted. So, as she was said, Miss O'Connor just left. Yeah. <laughs> go ahead. Well, basically, the motion was to send allow this um, BTE to go to the county commissioners, and it was unanimous yes by all five board members to send this over to the commissioners. Thank you. Thank you. I do have a request, though. And it, I'm, I mean, I said yes because they got to move it forward, but perhaps next year we can have the, well, if you get the information earlier and get the <coughs> release from the state, we can have the more thorough discussion so we can have a better understanding. We, I, I read and read that thing yep. that, I mean, I'm hope we're voting right. Yep. We'd, we'd be happy to make sure you get it early. To it's understand been it. ready for a, a week now, I'm sure, so. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Yep. And so our next presentation, thank you, Ms. Um, Jolene is here to, McShane is here to talk about the special education audit. Mrs. McShane. Good evening, Dr. Kane, Madam President, and board members. Um, so I'm here tonight to talk to you about our um, triennial um, comprehensive audit that we, as the special education department, go through um, with MSDE. So um, every three years, and actually this will be changed to every four years moving forward, um, the State Department comes out and they do an audit of the Special Education Department. That includes um, our infants and toddlers, our school age programs, as well as students that are participating in home hospital instruction that may have an IEP. This year we had our audit um, in May. It was over the course of four days. Um, so it was May 29th through the 31st, and then they had to come back for um, one of the case studies uh, the, the following week. The, um, the areas that it included, included the Board of Education, Ken Island Elementary School, Churchill Elementary School, Centerville Middle, and Queen Anne's County High School. Those schools are chosen at random um, by MSDE, and we're notified about three weeks ahead of time, three weeks to a month ahead of time, which schools will be selected, in addition to the files that will be chosen. Um, they come with three compliance specialists uh, from MSDE. The first day was for a record review. The second day was an ongoing record review as well as an infants and toddlers case study. And then the third day was a school-aged case study. Um, so the purpose of the audit is to really kind of look at and analyze the local school system, their infants and toddlers program, school-age program, and then really ensure that there's a compliance and alignment with federal and state regulations. Um, it's also to ensure that there is a system of general supervision in place to monitor progress and also really kind of put the emphasis on data informed decision making, that we improve outcomes for students with disabilities, and that the focus kind of falls on the areas of early childhood, professional learning, equitable services, and then differentiated and specialized instruction, and then also uh, secondary transition. I would like to say before I move further into the results that this could not, this, this is a very large feat and cannot be conducted without the tremendous teamwork that took place in this county. Um, and that went from the, the level of our special educators all the way up to um, the teacher specialists that are here at the board. And we, you know, we were ready for them. They did a desk audit from MSDE of over 40 files. And then um, when they came here to the board on site, we had all 40 files ready for them to review as well as the related service logs. So they do a cross-divisional analysis of the trend data and basically they're looking at our historical data. Um, annually we are given a, a performance report card. So they look at that data and they notice the trends to kind of make sure that the, um, that the data that they're seeing when they're here is reflective of that, that data as well. Um, as I mentioned, they do the desk audit of the files that, and it looks at both the home hospital IFSPs, which is the, um, the our, our babies, our birth to three, um, and IEPs, including our non-public schools as well. They also do look at our policies and procedures for both Part B and Part C. Um, Part C being our babies and then Part B being our school age um, programs. 
They do ask of the staff here to do a self audit. So you are asked to do 20 um, self audits of the school age program and then 10 self audits of the infants and toddler program. So <coughs> we are to select files at random and then audit them to get an idea of how we feel that we're doing so that when they, com when they come in, they can compare what we feel that we've done and how we perform compared to how they feel that we perform to see if there's you know a, a parallel there once they come they do um, an on-site review of 20 additional cases or 20 additional cases at the infant and toddler level level 40 at the school age level they're looking for things that include compliance quality and accuracy as well as documentation and related services they did um, conduct interviews with a general educator, special educator, the IEP chair, and an administrator at each of the three schools that they visited. Uh, there were two case studies at the infants and toddlers level, and those files were reviewed back three years versus the um, other 20 and 40 files that were just looked at um, the, current, the, the current year. And then those six case studies of school-aged children at Churchill, Centerville Middle, and Queen Anne's High School. They um, actually go into the classroom and observe the student in their, in their setting, um, and then following the observation, that's when they conduct the interviews with the staff. This aligns to the statewide differentiated framework, and this is, um, if you look at the triangle on the left, you'll see that there are four different levels of support. There's universal, targeted, focused, and intensive. Um, I'm happy to say that Queen Anne's fell in the universal tier. Uh, so I, I, again, give kudos to the staff um, on their diligence to a lot of the different indicators that, that we are, that we live by. Um, on the right-hand side, you see the inverted triangle, and that is, it corresponds directly to the, um, the level on the left. So if you fall within the universal tier, you are provided technical assistance as needed, um, and you're provided the smallest amount of technical assistance. Now, in the event that you needed more and you requested more, they're always going to provide you more, but um, you're only required to meet that bottom tier. As you go up the left-hand side, you see that the, in the amount of targeted support increases, and they provide additional support, and um, with that comes additional monitoring. So I am very happy to say that we fell in the universal tier. <laughs> but how do they determine, yeah, okay, this is post-audit? This is post-audit information, okay. Okay. Um, and basically what they do is they have a rubric that they go through and they give you scores, whether you're compliant or non-compliant. And if you don't have the sufficient number of compliant factors, then you, you will fall out of that universal tier. So for infants and toddlers, um, we had several commendations. Uh, we are very family-centered, and um, actually 100% of the parents that were interviewed um, had nothing but positive things to say about our program and that they were satisfied with the service delivery provided. Um, we are very proud to say that we provide our services in the natural environment, and we do incorporate coaching um, for the families so that when we're not there, the learning can still continue. Um, we we did, have done a really nice job with the child outcome summary, which is also commonly referred to as COS, um, where we have not only asked our, our staff to be trained in COS, but then to also demonstrate competency. Um, and then we, we keep that on record. We have a timely provision of transition from uh, the early intervention to the preschool, 100%. Again, 100% of the families surveyed were satisfied, and we have an effective interagency child find system. Um, again, you know, it's a very smooth transition from infants and toddlers over to um, our our Part C, our Part B services, and um, in addition to that, any of our private school um, identification with our centers. Some of the things, you know, with every audit comes some commendations and some considerations. Some of the considerations that we needed, um, we were 
slightly antiquated in our policies and procedures. Um, and to kind of answer to that, we had actually started prior to this audit taking place, uh, revamping our handbook. And I can successfully say that we have completed it. Um, and it has been to our council and been vetted. So it just, um, the next step is it will come to you for your review and approval. Um, the next piece is to provide professional learning opportunities in order to utilize coaching. As I mentioned, um, we do incorporate coaching into our, our practice, uh, but they would have liked to have seen a little bit more of the coaching, less of the delivery and more of the coaching. Um, and so we have partnered with FAMScale to integrate that coaching model into their service delivery. So again, there's more of that learning taking place um, once we leave. And then finally, um, to implement local strategies with fidelity to sustain and improve the level of results. Um, so we have ongoing professional learning <coughs> um, to, to build capacity and really to engage parents. Um, we are working on implementing this year um, a parent-teacher partnership where it's a collaboration between parent and child um, and, and teacher so that they can open that, that line of communication and have open dialogue about uh, different issues so that we can see it from both sides. I'm sorry, I'm very short and I can't, I can't it's, see you. Uh, <laughs> Jen and I said that when you sat down, it was like, where is she? <laughs> Go ahead, we're sorry. Um, <laughs> So moving over to the school age, um, it's a much larger population. Uh, so it's it's not just our uh, birth to three, but now we're looking at our, our five, three to five to 21. Um, so some of the commendations included a prevalence of co-teaching models um, and an understanding of what that that those models meant. Um, they were very pleased to see so many different models being used in the secondary schools and when interviewed they were able to provide lots of feedback about why they were using specific models. Um, they were also very pleased to see that all of our schools have content area specialists, so they have reading specialists, math specialists, and teacher specialists um, because it allows for a lot more targeted professional learning for the staff. They uh, saw lots of different data collection methods, um, and it was across the board, not just in academics, but in academics, behavior, um, you know, functional adaptive skills, et cetera. And not just using one tool, but using lots of different data collection tools. 99% <coughs> of the students with IEPs participated in state assessments, which was above the target. Um, and it also means that we are within the 1% cap for our students that are, that are taking the alternate assessments. So that is um, a feather in our cap. And 85% of the students with disabilities are graduating with a high school diploma, which is well above the state average, well above the state average. And truthfully, um, we did do a deep dive into that to kind of see, you know, perhaps where some of that was stemming from. And a lot of it um, is believed to come from a lot of that credit recovery, um, our creative, you know, approach with APA, mm -hmm. et cetera. So it has really kind of set us above, above the, the notch in that department. Um, and then 100% of timely identification of students transitioning from part C to part B. So again, um, there are some things that we need to, to look at and, and work on. And a lot of these things, as you can see in the green, we have already started working on. Um, the first one is to continue to self-monitor to identify and correct non-compliance. And so one of the things that we have instituted is um, we developed in collaboration with MSDE's tool, um, a quality IEP rubric. So MSDE has um, a, an IEP rubric for you to use to self-monitor IEPs, but we took it and made it a little bit more specific to Queen Anne's County. Um, and then we are, we are comparing that to that same triangle framework that the state uses for their comprehensive audits. We're using that for our IEP audits. And so in addition to individual scores, we'll also have school scores to be able to really target where our areas of need lie and where that um, technical assistance should be applied. We also need to consider um, professional learning in collaboration with general education to take place to ensure that 
um, practices are relevant to the provision of a tiered system of support. So that's those tier one, two, and three. Um, and being mindful that, that tier three, while it can be special education, is not only special education, but that specially designed instruction runs through tier one, tier two, and tier three. Um, and that it is very much a team approach from the side of general education and special education working together as a team. And we have partnered with Maryland Coalition for Inclusive Education to continue that conversation with our IEP chairs. Um, and through coaching, that will trickle down to our special education teachers as well um, to really kind of develop a greater understanding of what that tiered system is and what it looks like in the classroom in conjunction with what specially designed instruction is and what it looks like in the classroom. The next one is the lack of alignment between IEP goals and um, Maryland standards and we um, during our, our back to school teacher professional development day um, we did focus on this very strongly we have a subscription to goal book um, one of our messages was that goal book is a tool it's not a goal bank but there are lots and lots of resources available so we did have um, some professional learning from a representative from goal book come <coughs> out and and worked with the staff on how to use this tool to align the IEP goals to the standards. And then we need to better define student, the student achievement model um, to assist in eligibility and identification. So keeping in mind some of our disproportionality and, and really being able to look at um, children as a whole as well as you know equity and understanding all of the different dynamics that go into making a child what they are and who they are um, and and taking all of those pieces into consideration before applying a label so really kind of better defining that process for our special educators as well as our parents so that there's a better understanding of what makes a child who they are these were areas we needed improvement correct gotcha. mm -hmm. questions And can you go back to that last slide? Sure. Please? So when was it this school year starting is when we started mm -hmm. implementing this? Or when did you get this report and start working towards these goal improvements? So we met with MSDE. Um, we met with them August 9th, I believe, um, and went over all of the results and, and whatnot with the State Department. Okay. A lot of these things we had, many of them we had already identified. Gotcha. Um, and so we had started that before they came in. Even um, before the school was, school system, uh, school before was Before school over. was out. Gotcha. Yep. Um, so we were kind of ahead of, of the game before they came in and told us our results. Um, otherwise, we would still be working on a lot of these things. But we can proudly say that we have 90% of these <coughs> already in place. They're right. not complete um, because these these are very long, you know, initiatives that we're working on. Um, but we're very happy to say that they're, we've already started that process. Great. Thank you. Anything else? Okay. Well, and I don't have a question specifically about your presentation. Just as a social worker, I wanted to add um, to the dialogue, the conversation. Um, what sometimes happens with families who have a student that requires some of these services, it can be very confusing for them as they start to navigate the landscape within the school, the school system. There's a wonderful group, it's called Maryland Coalition of Families, and I just want to put that out there that, the, that uh, it is a free service for families to work with a family navigator who has been through this experience and can help them navigate within the school system um, how to best utilize um, some of the resources so that their student and their child can take full advantage of uh, the public education system with uh, special needs. So that's called Maryland Coalition of Families and they're here in, um, there's an office in each county. So I just want to put that out there for the public. We're, we've also, um, one of the other initiatives that we are implementing this school year um, for those those families that are found to be eligible for an IEP, um, they're given a binder and it is actually called navigating the IEP uh, or the C's of the IEP. We're trying to stick with the whole nautical theme of, of Queen Anne's County. Um, 
And it in that, it is a binder for parents to keep all of their information organized. And on the left-hand side are all the resources. There's a, a, a whole book of resources and um, organizations that are found within Queen Anne's County as well as other counties on the shore. Um, and I think that I know that they're located or they're listed in that that resource. Oh, wonderful, good. Um, because a lot of the family navigators are um, parents whose children have gone through this experience and then they've gone on to work for more Maryland Coalition of Families as an advocate because of their personal experience. Um, so they're, they're really um, wonderful people who, who are doing good work um, that can help out um, in this, this whole subject area. Thank, thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, thank you. I just want to add thing. Um, looks like we made the right choice with Jolene. Yes, that yes, was very did. good. Um, thank you. For your first presentation to us. Thank you. And and thank you, uh, Ms. McShane. And one thing I just wanted to clarify is that with and thank you. I'm glad that you mentioned that. Our uh, thank you, Mr. P. That your um, handbook is being vetted by your group. Um, it does not need to come back for approval, oh, but we I'm are happy sorry. to. Yep, yeah, we'll make sure that you see it and, and that we share it with you. Yes, we just have to present it. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That's it for our presentations. Okay. <laughs> Looks like we lost our audience. Mr. Yeah. Simmons is hanging in there. <laughs> well, at this time, we're scheduled for a break. Does anyone want to take a break, or do we want to keep moving? <clears throat> okay. How long do you need? Five, five ten minutes. minutes. I mean, five minutes. Five minutes. Okay, that's fine. Okay. So we'll bring the meeting back, and now we will go to the um, expenditure report. Mr. Bister, can you share that report for us, please? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Maggio, members of the board. Um, expenditure report in 8.01 is presented for your review. No approval is necessary or action on your part. It's simply for review only, uh, as there's no transfers or object classifications or anything like that. Um, please note this report is as of 831, so there's not a whole big story to tell because we just started the fiscal year. Teachers haven't been back, um, but we wanted to present this to you for tonight. So with that, uh, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to entertain them. Um, you'll get more substantive reports as we get further in the year. I thank you very much. Did anyone question. have any questions? Yeah, this is, this is just for August then? Uh, through August, from, from July 1 through August 31st. Okay. Okay, then we move on to the HR report. Board members, uh, Dr. Kane, Ms. DiMaggio, I'd like to ask that you approve the HR report as presented. I make a motion that we approve the HR report as presented. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Oh, wait a minute. Sorry for I get yelled at. <laughs> Are we supposed to? Board members, how do you vote? Ms. O'Connor? Aye. George? Ms. DiMaggio? Aye. Ms. Harlow? Aye. Aye. I'm sorry, Ms. Kelly? Aye. Thank you. We move on to the transportation report. Yes, board members, uh, Ms. DiMaggio, we have uh, 57 substitute bus drivers that we um, uh, approve each year. They're just, just an annual renewal of the substitute bus drivers. And <laughs> instead of reading all their names, I just went through at 57. Um, <laughs> that works just keep fine. Keep it short. And then the second part to that is we have a Wendy Palmitary whose bus will be uh, 12 years old at the end of this year who is requesting a, to purchase a new bus next year um, and just would like for that approval. She operates up north North County. the County and has a lot of miles on her and she's experiencing quite a bit of mechanical problems on her bus. So I look for the approval of the 57 um, Substitute bus drivers and then the approval of the purchase of bus by Wendy Palmitary. May I have a motion to approve the transportation report as presented? So moved. Second. Board members, how do you vote? Ms. Kelly? Aye. Ms. DiMaggio? Ms. Harlow? Aye. Ms. DiMaggio? Aye. Ms. O'Connor? Aye. Ms. George? Aye. You got it. <laughs> This is not going to work. <laughs> I know. <laughs> uh, policies for the second read final. Uh, Code of Ethics Policy Number 104, uh, Non Discrimination and Equity Policy Number 421, and Non 
non-discrimination and equity. Regulation students number 421.1 and non-discrimination and equity regulation employees number 421.2. May I have a motion to approve the code of ethics policy and the non-discrimination and equity policies as presented? Okay. Can, can, can um, we hang? Yeah. Can we hang? Yeah. I'm sorry, Mr. Farley. Isn't this the one that we're going to hold until um, it is reviewed once? No, final? we would like to ask that the board approve it, conditioned upon a final review That's by board council. Okay. And this is the one you're going to go on after, Mr. Burns. I would like to not to approve the ethics. I think Mr. Burns is going to make okay. a comment. For the record, Darren Burns, Board Council, uh, President DiMaggio, members of the Board, Dr. Kane, I, I think sp the specific policies that you're referencing are the non-discrimination equity policies as opposed to, for instance, the eth ethics policy. Uh, Mr. Farley, as he noted, he and I spoke, and the policies and the regulations that follow on non-discrimination -discrimi equity are, are, I would say, 98 percent complete. There are some small minor things as this law continually develops that are worth, you know, tweaking and finalizing, and it certainly isn't going to change any of the substance. If anything, it will help us dovetail these policies with some of the most recent OCR directives. And then again, those are a moving target. You try to be as as up to date as you can. I think it's important that the board approve this because you can get these published and out faster and in the schoolhouses and in the workplaces. But I did tell Mr. Farley that I will take a look at this over the next couple of days and to the extent there's any changes in law or regulations or references or ordering of protected classes, I'll fix that. And then I would say beyond that, I'd recommend your approval of those particular policies. Okay. So may I have a mo oh it's already on the table so I need um I'm sorry but the code of ethics one I would like to hold off on um, it, it needs but some are you saying Darren you just talking about non-descriptive uh, which one are you are you talking about the entire thing no. or speaking I'm speaking to um, because I heard uh, what what uh, Captain Kelly said I'm speaking to in particular the uh, non-discrimination and equity policy and follow-on regulations uh, which really are separate from the ethics policy. It may be in the posture for your review and approval. I I'm not addressing that. It is separate from discrimination equity. Issues. Okay, so we just need to take that out then. And we're going to approve the non-discrimination and equity policies as presented, correct? Well, you have a motion on the floor and you have a member who's who's expressing a, will, uh, a, a desire not to approve one of them, I think you've got to first straighten out where your motion is and what's okay. what's up for approval. Okay. All right. I think we need to separate these. And you could I certainly. I think we need to separate these. Okay. They are separate. So you can. And vote separate on each one of them. Right. Okay. And, and as a technical matter, like you're voting we, on policy, not, not regulation. Regulated. Because exactly. the regulation would, is what the superintendent approves, but there it's before you so you understand what what she's going to do and follow on to your policy. Right. And so, as you know, now we present the policy with the reg, but if there were going to be a change to the policy, we would not move forward with the reg either because we would want to have them in alignment. Okay. So, okay. but but the point of it, they are separate policies and they do need to be voted on separately. Separate. Okay. Um, and so the issue is whether or not you want to hold the code of co um, ethics or hold both or, or whichever for the non-discrimination and equity. So that's what you got to do. And my, my comments were directed uh, solely at the employment, uh, I mean, excuse me, the, the discrimination and equity related policies. So you think, so we should actually vote on the ethics policy separate from the non discrimination and equity policies? Okay. You should. Okay. So we need to do two votes then? So I would say so, yes. <laughs> Okay. So I think we have to withdraw the motions and yes. re-motion for both of these votes yes. to be separated. Separated. Okay, that's fine. Okay. To withdraw your motions. So, may I have a motion to approve the code of ethics policy as presented? That's what she would like to hold. I'd like to hold on. We'd okay, like to but table everybody that. needs to vote on that. Okay. 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 I mean, I think everybody needs to vote. So, 
Okay, so we'll start. And you've asked, you've asked for a motion. That's the request. Well, yeah, I haven't even gotten a motion to. Right. I, I have a motion. That I need a. <laughs> okay well I thought that we had so okay so we we're gonna withdraw the original motion that said uh, may I have a motion to approve the code of ethics policy and non discrimination and equity policies as presented together now we are going to do them separate okay so once again may I have a motion to approve the code of ethics policy as presented I move. I need a second that's fine fine okay so may I have a motion to approve the uh, oh, wait a minute the non-discrimination and equity policies as presented so moved second <laughs> you're on <laughs> but members how do you vote miss o'connor um yes miss george yes miss dimaggio yes miss harlow yes captain kelly aye thank you on the ethics one Ms. President, I, I just want to um, give us a little more time on it. I don't want to drop the whole thing. I think it needs some corrections, and I'll uh, talk to Mr. Farley. When I read through it, um, there's some things I think are, are not clear on it. So I don't want to completely drop the idea. I just don't want to vote on it yet. Okay, so we'll move to 9.04 field trips, Centerville Middle School to North Bay, November 12th through the 14th, and Stevensville Middle School and Mattapique Middle School to North Bay, November 14th through the 16th. I move that we approve those uh, three North Bay trips. Second. <coughs> Board members, how do you vote? Yes. Ms. O'Connor? Ms. George? Yes. Ms. DiMaggio? Yes. Ms. Harlow? Yes. Kelly? Aye. Thank you. have them all Jackie I do thank okay you. so then we're going to move to 10.01 policies for first read employee discipline policy number 701 and regulation number 701.1 may I have a motion to approve the employee discipline policy for first read as presented this will go to air stakeholders for review So moved. Um, <laughs> Board members, how do you vote? Ms. O'Connor? This is first read, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, yes. Ms. George? Yes. DiMaggio? Yes. Ms. Harlow? Yes. Ms. Kelly? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Now we move on to 10.02, School Board Citizen Advisory Committee. Ms. Harlow, would you like to take over at this time? Sure. I've announced the last three meetings that we are developing the Citizens Advisory Committee. We talked in depth about that in our board meeting on the 29th of August, and that can be viewed on W, I mean, well, it can be viewed on QAC TV as well as um, the board's Facebook page Jeff has it posted and it's just given an overview of how we're going to structure the committee um, and get a press release out inviting community members to join this committee and um, whether or not there will be any uh, employees will not be a part of this committee we have employee committees that Dr. Kane has already in, in um, process and future and vision so we have really defined how we're going to structure this group in the future and um, that will be coming up soon. Chair, I'd like to thank you for all your hard work that you've yes. done for this. Uh, I'm actually um, looking forward to this for us. I think it will be a big improvement. Uh, we're, we're one of the very few counties who do, do not have a Citizens Advisory Committee and um, it will take its shape as it should 
through those citizens participation and what their vision is for this organization um, they will be a standalone committee the board will not attend their meetings we will not guide them in what they do or how they do it they will come back and report to us monthly they will probably do a small presentation once in a while give us an overview of what they've been working on what the community concerns are and kind of keep us in, your in the community <laughs> communication loop oh that's it Thank, Thank you, you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, citizen public comment. Is there anyone who would like to speak um, at this time? Uh, we'll move on to future meetings and events. September 11th is the BTE master plan to county commissioners, 1015 a.m. at the Liberty Building. Yes. Okay. September 19th, there'll be a school board work session. October 3rd is a school board meeting. Um, sorry, it's been canceled and moved to the 10th because of the uh, annual MAID conference, which is held in Ocean City October 3rd through the 5th, and October 17th as of right now, school board work session. Um, may I have a motion to adjourn? Moved. Second. All in, oh, oh, can I say it here? Scan out. Mm -hmm. we can, it's regular here? Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The eyes have it. What was that? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.